Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program that features the lives of the saints and reflections on the Sunday readings, along with information on a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Corda. Our program is brought to you through the annual Diocesan Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. Our interview segment today will feature the Vatican II document on education. We will also get a glimpse into the life and times of St. Hilary, along with reflections on the readings for this Feast of the Epiphany of the Lord. That and more on Wineskins. In our current issue segment, I will speak with Martha Coulter on Curcio. With me now is Martha Coulter, who is a parishioner at St. Jude Parish in Columbiana and also is on the team for Curcio here in the Diocese of Youngstown. Welcome to Wineskins. Thank you, Father. It's good to be here. You know, Martha, I had an opportunity to talk with Bill Joyce, who's really kind of like the head of the Curcio movement here within the diocese. And he talked about some of the nuts and bolts, the history of Curcio and the movement What we'd like to talk about today is just like your personal involvement in it. We know you're on the team, but what exactly do you do as a team member for Curcio? Well, it's interesting because I have two roles. I'm actually on the secretariat. I'm the post-Curcio chairperson. And so my role on the team is a little bit different. I'm just one of the girls. Mm. You know, we've been meeting now for, I think we've had three meetings, they're just my sisters, you know. They're mm-hmm. they're just a joy to be around. We're we're forming as a group. We're kind of figuring out what we're going to be on the weekend, and it's just such a joy to be with them. So I'm I'm just kind of one of the girls <laughs> on know, the team. We know that there's like a series of talks that the folks listen to, and you'll be involved in some of that. What would be some of the subject matter that you'll talk about and share with the girls that will be there? The first talk that I'm giving is the laity's role in the church. And that's what I am. I'm the laity. The second talk that I'm giving is going to be, it's either called action or evangelization, and how the laity is to be the action of the church. The We talk about in the weekend how the laity are the hands, the feet, the eyes, the ears of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so I get to kind of weave those two talks together. How has that changed you personally, this involvement with Curcio mm-hmm. in your own faith life? I'll, I'll never forget the weekend Bill Joyce asked me, hey, Martha, have you ever heard about Curcio? And I, I hadn't. I actually was the very, very last person to make the weekend back in 2006. And, you know, I have been on the other side of, we call it a retreat for lack of a better word. I've always been on the other side of that because I've been given retreats for years. And so to be able to be a recipient mm-hmm. was such a blessing for me. Mm-hmm. I loved my weekend, and it's changed my life. And it's one of the best gifts I've ever given myself. You know, I, I'm not from this part. You know, I grew up in South Dakota, and so I really didn't have a lot of people that I knew, a lot of girlfriends, a lot of sisters in Christ. I call them my posse. Mm-hmm. And so being a part of that weekend, it just changed my life. It connected me with some amazing women who will continue to be lifelong friends. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting as you talk about that, what comes to mind is any time we experience a renewal or a retreat, we are always conscious of who's with us. So there's a community there. And that community is really who we bond with. But then we bring that good news into the larger group, the larger community. And why is it important for us or for you to share that with somebody else? You know, in my lady talk, I said, you know, no man is an island, Mm -hmm. and we're not meant to do this life by ourselves. And to have a group of women, and for me, because it's a woman's weekend, to have a group of women that I can partner with to be Christ in a bigger, more social way, you know, we do a lot as group sisters that I probably wouldn't do by myself. They're kind of my um, my group of sisters that advise me. They're my, I can't think of the word I'm trying to use, but we're in it together and we serve together. In our last few minutes of our time together, what would you like to tell the folks that are with us who might be interested in learning more about the Curcio or might be a little kind of afraid about their involvement? What's all involved if they come to that? 
I think that COVID has shut down so much. And I think that we all lost a lot during COVID. I, I'm so happy that this is coming back again after all this. We're not meant to be in isolation. I can't think of a better gift to give oneself is to to be a part of something bigger and better than yourself. And I wouldn't be who I am or where I am today if I didn't allow myself to be a part of that. I just can't encourage it more because I know what it's done for me. And I know what it's done for my group sisters. It's just a beautiful experience. I wouldn't want anybody to miss it. Well, Martha Coulter, thank you so much for your presence on Wineskins today. We look forward to you uh, being back with us to share some more information on the Curcio. And we encourage the ladies, especially since this will be a ladies weekend, to contact you or Bill or the diocese to get more information and to really encourage them to participate in the Curcio movement. Thank you. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. St. Hilary was a bishop and doctor of the church. To tell us more is Lou Jack Kay. He is from St. Brendan Church in Youngstown. St. Hilary was called the Athanasius of the West and was declared a doctor of the church by Pope Pius IX. The cult of this saint became widespread in France only in the 9th century and in Italy in the 11th and 12th centuries. Converted from paganism after reading the Bible, and especially the prologue of the Gospel of St. John. This married man and father later became a gifted interpreter of the Psalms and the Gospel according to St. Matthew. While still a layman, he was elected Bishop of Poitiers in France in the year 350. Eventually, he was sent into exile for his anti-Arianism. The point at issue was the consubstantiality of the Son with the Father. In other words, that they were of the same nature. This was defended by St. Athanasius in the East. In his treatise on the Blessed Trinity, St. Hilary became the first theologian of the Latin Church to combat the Arian heresy and to introduce into the language of the West the precisions of Catholic doctrine and Greek thought. He also helped St. Martin of Tours promote the monastic life and he composed several liturgical hymns. The opening prayer of the Mass replaces the ancient Parisian phrase proclaimed the dignity of the Word to defended the divinity of Christ, your Son. Hilary had in fact fought unsuccessfully in defense of the Orthodox faith. He also showed prudence and moderation amid the hostility of those bishops who repented of their past errors who were allowed to remain in office. It was written of him that the whole world ought to recognize that our French nation was freed from the sin of heresy through the intervention of Bishop Hillary. It was under St. Hillary that the clergy recognized more and more that even in a Christian state, the church must be separate and independent. The relevance of Hillary's message can be deduced from the opening prayer of the Mass, in which we ask God to give us a deeper understanding of the divinity of Christ and help us to profess it in all truth. Moreover, in his treatise on the Holy Trinity, he exhorts us to be faithful to the teaching of sacred scripture. He prayed that the Lord will impart to us the meaning of the words of scripture and the light to understand it. Finally, it's interesting to note that in a letter to his daughter, Abra, he urged her to renounce marriage and remain a virgin. His feast is celebrated on January 13th. For Wineskins, I'm Lou Jack Hay. Welcome to our segment called Year of Faith, celebrating the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council. I'm Father Jim Corda. And I'm Father Jeffrey Mickler of the Society of St. Paul. And the decree we're going to discuss today is the Declaration on Christian Education. This declaration is important because from the first century to the 21st, Christianity, Catholicism, has been an educational tool for humanity. What's life all about? Who is God? What does God expect of us? How could we live a godly life in the midst of an ungodly world? That has happened throughout the history of the church, whether it was the education given in the family or the education given in universities or seminaries. It's an important part of 
our heritage and a responsibility that we all have. Well, and I think this document is very clear when it says that education is a right for everybody. And how important is that for us in the church? We know for us in the United States that education is very important. What about for us in the church? Well, education comes from the word to be led out, to be led forward. And from childhood through our adult years, we all need to be educated and re-educated and re-educated so that we could learn more and more about what life's about and what God is about in the midst of this life. To be uneducated is to be unarmed and to be vulnerable to the attacks of ignorance, the attacks of bigotry, the attacks of chaos that comes from thinking right is wrong and wrong is right. And so education really gives us something we need so desperately. And the church really was fundamental in beginning the educational system, the college system. Um, For example, in the United States, uh, probably around 40s and 50s, almost every parish had a school. So that whole mission of sharing the faith through education was so crucial. Uh, Why was that important and how has that changed today? Well, within the context of the history of the United States, the public school system more and more were seen as a Protestant public school system and Catholics didn't feel at home within that system. And so the church began to give of the possibility for Catholic children to be formed within Catholic schools. Now, what has happened over the decades is that the public school system stopped having any religious influence whatsoever and is now a secular public education system. And so no real sincere believer, Protestant or Catholic, will feel completely at home in our public schools. But the Catholic mandate to educate children and give them a Catholic education still remains. Uh, The numbers attending Catholic schools and the number of Catholic schools have declined, but the need for them is as great as ever, if not greater. Let's go back to um, the sacrament of baptism. We believe as Catholics, and we say in our right, that parents are the teachers of their children in the ways of the faith. They're to be the best of teachers. How often do parents really embrace that mandate to be a teacher to their children, especially in faith? Well, here parents feel inadequate like in so many areas. And also the godparents had that same mandate. And in both cases, I think there's been a sort of a dereliction of duty. They said, well, let the priest or the nuns take care of it. But the home is the primary education spot for every child. And the contemporary movement to have simply the public schools being the dominant educator of children is fraught with danger and has produced many unintended but very real bad results. Parents have to be involved with the education of their children, whether it's in public school, private school, or Catholic school, and have to say to themselves, what key values that are non-negotiable that I want my children to have so that they could have a shot at a godly, happy, joyful life. Let's talk about the role of teachers. Mm -hmm. We know that teachers are are very important, not only in the educational system, but in the life of the church in general. What does the document tell us about the role of teachers in the life of the church and in institutions? Well, the role of a teacher is not only to convey intellectual information, but to give example, to give testimony by actions that what is being taught is of enormous value. We have not only the formal schools, but we have like the Sunday schools, the catechetical schools for children in the public schools, but we also have great universities. We have the mandate to be teachers to the adults of our parishes more than ever so that they could then effectively teach their children. 
to know not only what is right and wrong, but why something's right and why something's wrong. It's a lifelong task for all of us. Let's continue that whole idea that learning in education is a, an ongoing, lifelong process. It's not something that ended uh, with eighth grade or twelfth grade, but it's an ongoing. And, and oftentimes, you know, I've had uh, some older people say, oh, I can never learn that. Oh, I'm too old to learn that. That's really a fallacy, isn't it? Well, it is a fallacy. And you might not be able to learn something like that, but you could always try. And in the trying itself, it expands your capacity to get a grip on reality and to keep a grip on reality and also to understand, boy, I still am an important person. Off and on now, at age 66, I've been studying physics from MIT over the internet. I don't understand half of what they're talking about, but the half of what I am learning says, oh, that's very interesting. It keeps my brain stimulated, and I see it from the viewpoint of faith and say, God is amazing in the way he put together this world. And so education in all fields is so important for all of us. And why is education important for the young and the old? Because it helps our mind. It stimulates us. It helps us not only in the rudimentary things of life, but especially in the faith. And how important is it for us to be educated in the faith? It's important because we swim through a sea of profanity, ignorance, and falsehood. For example, pop culture says sexual intercourse between any consenting individuals is always good and normal. That has been embraced by the public school system. We say sexuality is something much more. It's sacred, it's holy, it's sacramental, and it's key to keeping humanity alive and vibrant. So you can see the vast differences in opinions and the truth. Father Jeff, one final comment before we close. Let's pray for our teachers that they be truly holy Catholic as well as informed in their specialties. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. And I'm Father Jeffrey Mickler of the Society of St. Paul. For more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Bishop Dave Bonner of the Diocese of Youngstown. Christmas is a blessed time to remember the miraculous gift of God's love in Jesus, the newborn King. We recall the angel's message announced over 2,000 years ago. Today, in the city of David is born to you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. As we celebrate his birth, may his gifts of love and peace be born again in our hearts and homes this Christmas season. 33 million Americans have descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nations. Our song today is from the CD entitled Signatures. It is by John Michael Talbot. Come, worship the Lord, for we are His people, the flock that He shepherds.
God, the mighty God, the great King o'er all the gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the highest mountains as well. He made the sea. It belongs now to him. The dry land too was formed by his hand. Our scripture reflection for this feast of the Epiphany of the Lord will be done by Deacon Mike Kajancic. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman. For the past 36 years, I've been involved in the RCA process at our parish, and I love it. It's not simply about sharing my love of the faith with others, helping them to get to know God as I know Him. It's more about welcoming a new group of searchers looking for answers to the basic questions of life. Who am I? Why am I? At first, quiet and reserved, these inquirers soon begin to open up, and by me listening to their stories, these once strangers expand my faith in the kingdom of God. But it's not always that way in the world out there. We're taught to become afraid of strangers. They can make demands on our time and resources. We also have come to believe that if they are different from us, they must be inferior to us, so let's be on our guard. We'll let them get close enough to keep an eye on them but not close enough that we actually get to know them. In the gospel today, strangers arrive in Jerusalem bearing gifts for the newborn king of the Jews, and Herod is disturbed by these strangers who were drawing closer to the center of Jewish life. Herod lets them close enough not to help them in their quest, but to keep an eye on them. He doesn't want to upset the status quo. Don't rock the boat was his guiding principle. And that could happen if these outsiders come in and change his world so he was on his guard. The Jewish people were also disturbed. How dare these outsiders, who were different and therefore inferior, look for salvation when God gave that gift to them? They were on their guard as well. These magi from the east bearing gifts did not want to be strangers. They wanted to become part of the family of God. They wanted to hear the secrets of a way of life that could lead to salvation. They knew there was a world beyond this one, And here in the guiding light from a star, they were being shown the way. Now let's look at our position on this Feast of Epiphany in the year 2023. We are not outsiders like the Magi. In fact, we consider ourselves the insiders, members of a faithful community. Our turn has come to be the keepers of the sacred words received from God and the prophets. We think we know it all and no longer have to look for Him because we do know it all. We are content with the status quo. Epiphany reminds us today that we are not to be content with the status quo as long as there are strangers among us, strangers who are in poverty, in need, in neglect. 
We are all co-inheritors and members of the one body of Christ. So when one suffers, all suffers. With God there are no strangers, no distinctions, no separation. In God's vision all are family and are to share in the glory of God. But as long as there are those who deny and fail to share with others, who desire to keep the status quo, this vision will not become a reality. Unlike Herod, we cannot become complacent with things the way they are, and we must do our part to help bring about salvation to all, friend and foe, neighbor and enemy, family and stranger. At least we must pay attention to those signs by which people try to break down the barriers between us, signs of forgiveness, of hope and kindness, of needs and desires, and we must do our part to help break down those barriers and become family. This is what brought the Magi to Jerusalem to seek the Messiah so many years ago, a desire to be one family. For they realized that we must, that together we can reach outward, reach new dimensions, new visions, and perform new wonders that bring all closer to God and one another. And no longer will we be strangers to one another, but family. For Wineskins, I'm Deacon Mike Kojancic. Being a faithful Christian is not about doing, but about receiving. Jesus received the gifts of the Magi in gold, frankincense, and myrrh. May we receive the gift of the Lord Jesus this day. Wineskins is made possible by the annual Diocesan Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. Wineskins is produced by the Roman Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda, thanking you for being with us. Have a blessed Sunday, and may God be with you. What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. <laughs> what have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife, and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.